My name is Jason. My name is Tom. And this is Fear of a Black Dragon, an old school RPG podcast. And in this episode, we pay a visit to the deadliest magical lion since Barry Sanders, Mortzengestorm, the mad manticore of the prismatic peak. Our first segment is a basic crawl. Mortzengersturm, the Mad Menticore of the Prismatic Peak, is a 36-page 5e compatible adventure for 5 to 6 players of 3rd to 4th level. That's a lot of numbers, huh? <laughs> Written by Trey Causey with art and maps by Jeff Call. Editing and proofing by Jack Scher, Humza Kazmi, Robert Parker, and Andrea Causey. Layout by Lester B. Portley and Trey Causey. It was published in 2017 by the Hydra Cooperative. The text starts with some background, perhaps of use to the referee, where we learn a little bit about Mortzengersturm, the man, the manticore. From there, we move to the Wimwam Stone, a cluster of vibrant green hexagonal crystals imbued with wild magic, also known as the MacGuffin. And then we have a section on adventure hooks. From there, we learn a little bit about the prismatic peak, including how to reach the peak, which is done via the snail elevator, a giant snail with seats that climbs a spiral ramp. After that, it's on to the meat of the book, which is the key to Mortzengersturm's mansion, its grounds, and what lies beneath. This is your classic uh, detailed uh, key to the dungeon. Each one has an at-a-glance summary in the margin. So first off, there is the entrance featuring flowers with human eyes that stare at you some hippogriff guards, and a recorded greeting from the manticore himself. Next is the audience chamber, including comically formal goblins and Mortzengersturm's first appearance in person. Uh, we're then off to uh, a tour of the grounds, passing by the kitchen and larder where you find food and useful supplies, plus a truculent imp in a jar, the goblinic slime vats where new goblins are created to serve the manticore, the hippogriffery where the hippogriffs live, also, a thief who got turned into a horse. Outside is the menagerie, featuring uh, variously the parrot bear, iron shrike, ink dog, ant lion, bumble bears, the fey ray, and the tiger pillar. Mortzengersturm's chambers, the end of the tour, in more ways than one, feature time for some refreshments. No wait, it's a trap. By the way, this is where the much-valued Wimwam stone is to be found. Adjacent to that is a treasure room, enough said. There's also a secret passage which leads to Thedabara's chamber. Uh, she used to be a famous actress, uh, now she's resting. And a vampire. Thedabara's portal is a door to nowhere, if you can't fly, that sticks out of the side of the cliff. And also below ground in the garden near the menagerie is the oubliette of the mistakes, which features uh, some more outlandish creatures created by the manticore, which are the mocha, the Gru Bird, found in the dark, a chimerical chimera, some jam, the Moonster, which is like a big talking moon, uh, a wizard's hat that's gone feral, and a magical portal. And then finally, for important chambers, there is Mortzengersturm's Imaginarium, and this is where the magic happens. A transdimensional spider from nowhere is also lurking here for a variety of reasons that are mostly coincidental. In the middle of all this, you'll find uh, what would be like a pull-out section, I guess, right? Which is the adventure rendered in the form of a retro children's board game, and also happens to function as a summary of the whole module. At the back, there are eight pre-gen characters for D&D 5e. Uh, there's a list of all the monsters and their stat blocks, and there is Appendix A, an introduction to the land of Azurth, and finally there is a map of Yanth country, as far as I could tell, this map is utterly immaterial to the adventure as such, but it is a very nice map. How have we used this adventure in our gaming? Tom, I've only read it. How about you? Yeah, I've run it twice. I ran it once as a one-shot, and then again as two sessions, uh, both times using Electric Bastion Land. I did use the pre-generated characters at the back, but I didn't bother printing out the stats. I just scrawled into the odd style stats onto the, onto the front part. Nice. So things we liked about Mortzengersturm, the Mad Manticore of the Prismatic Peak. I think we're going to have a lot to say about this module's 
tone and sense of humor Mm -hmm. we're going to hold that for a minute and talk about just some surface level things if that's okay yeah i think the illustrations here are wonderful especially that cover yeah i get this feeling of hanna-barbera comics you know like the the hanna-barbera cartoons used to have these comic books that came out as part of that whole brand or whatever and these like very much have that feeling The little board game map is a neat idea. It's very well rendered. And again, it has that same visual style. And the typefaces really emphasize this sort of retro cartoon, retro comic quality as well. The typefaces are really, really great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the uh, the title, I remember when I first learned of this, the title didn't grab me. But as soon as I saw that cover, I was like, okay, fine. I mean, this is done. Because, yeah, you're right. The fonts, everything's chosen perfectly. It has that yeah, it's Hanna Barbera. It's a little bit maybe the wizard's jewel in the black cauldron. You know the the funny Disney oh, characters yeah. as opposed mm-hmm. to the serious yeah. part. I suppose it's like those cartoons where the creators clearly had a little bit of psychedelic influences going on, but they were designing mainstream stuff for kids, so they they kept it they kind of coloured within the lines. That's kind of what it feels like to me. Yeah, it looks very much like this is the adventure you'd get if D and D had come out in the sixties, hmm. and then sort of like a little bit later you would get adventures like this and this is how they'd be packaged it's an interesting idea of like what an adventure can look like aesthetically anyway i thought that the sidebars are a very clever idea so the way it works in the text listeners are you have like the bulk of the text and the descriptive prose on each page basically and then there's a little sidebar that has just the core stats of whatever monster is implicated by the text or just the basic piece of information that you need to run the thing at the table i thought that was really great i like the way that information is organized and it seemed like it would be very functional at the table was that your experience is it a functional thing oh yeah it was actually i um i think it's interesting in that it's not just bolding things i mean we've talked about this in previous reviews about how it's good to call out the key elements within the key but yeah this idea of just saying eh, just forget all that stuff this is the part you need to remember i have seen this somewhere before relatively recently but it slips my mind at the moment but yeah this idea of picking the the one thing that you'd remember and i think the board game does that as well it shows you a picture for example of the one thing that would jog your memory in each segment yeah so i think yeah. that's i think the organizing principle isn't it rather than giving the first impression section it's the it's a hook for the gm which is yeah re- was really good yeah that's good to hear i i was curious if this was like a 5e convention because i've never looked at any 5e uh, books like might, literally never might, so I, might be i think i saw a 5e book once so uh yeah. but no i <laughs> but I, i've seen this in i think other adventures and definitely in like some of the ad and d stuff yeah i want to say around the period when dark sun was in production a couple of those not dark sun though uh, yeah but like that mm-hmm. i have i'm pretty sure i've seen that so yeah it's not 5e invented but maybe maybe it is well it's a neat idea people who play 5e can write in yeah i I feel like we've talked about this sort of thing a million times on the show like the way that information is presented and i don't think we've done one yet where it's pulled out like that and like literally set to the side for the gm i thought it was very clever Mm. some other adventures have done something similar but they keep the pulled out part tucked between the pros that's right they don't break the column out to the side yeah yeah something about the column thing really like makes a difference um it's interesting okay Let's get to the main part of our discussion here, which I think is going to be, I think you and I are going to have like slightly different feelings about it, but let's just approach it in the way we're going to approach it, which is this module has a very particular sense of humor. It is so punny. Every part has a punny name, has a punny... I was going to like pull out a couple of examples, but it's just like the whole text, so it almost seems like pointless to do examples. And so my question, that a big question I had was... And let me back up to you and say this. I think my reception to this, like my patience for this when I was reading it, was very much informed by the fact that we're in a really dark place in the world right now. There's so many crises happening and literally life and death and liberty, all these big issues at stake. And reading this module did not was not a balm <laughs> like it felt like it, it felt like very very insulting in a way like it was just not the right module i think to be reading in my headspace and so my question that i had when i was reading it is does it work in play is it funny in play like what is the effect here okay so the answer is yes and it's sort of for the reasons that you're alluding to here, which is that those jokes that are in the text don't 
emerge in the game. That that's not the funny part, right? So as a rule of thumb, yeah, I think it is true. If you can see the jokes, usually the adventure is not going to be that funny. Like if you can see the jokes that you're going to deliver to the players, you know, like paranoia. We'll always have like a couple of genuinely good joke names for the NPCs, and then the other ninety five percent of the NPCs. And the best ones were the ones that just set up uh, situations like the like the time when you you know you have all your paranoia troubleshooters in a submarine and you give them a layout of the dashboard and of course it looks like a modern day car dashboard and controls but all the controls do totally different things and they don't know what it is that's amusing to watch them screwing all that stuff up <laughs> and, and in this case yeah all those puns are well you've got to view it through the lens of this is the domain of an evil manticore wizard who's slightly too pleased with himself right and that's kind of the thing the point is that he'll deliver the puns and be like so did you like my irises and then everyone just goes <sighs> and that's the the joke is that he's he's not actually that funny. For example, there is that guy I forget his name, but he's there's a someone who broke into the peak to try and steal something, got uh, caught, the dwarf, yeah. was turned into a horse, and now lives right. in the hippogriffery. And the sort of the joke that's thrown in there is that he's always wearing a blanket with feathers on because Oh yeah, that was actually legit funny. Yeah, would, the hippogriffs can't tell the that, difference yeah. between themselves and a horse covered <laughs> right, in feathers. Yeah. But what's actually funny in play, is like, I don't think anyone really picked up on that in the game. What's actually funny is watching someone who's trying not to attract attention because he's on a guided tour of a wizard's mansion, trying to have a clandestine conversation with a horse who is scratching his answers in the floor with his hoof. That's like amusing, <laughs> but when you describe it, it isn't funny. But actually, right. as a situation, it's comical. Morts and Gustav's quotes that you get, like his sample dialogue. Yeah. Like if you were to just read them out to people, go oh, check out what this funny lion man said. That wouldn't be good. But when you start like delivering his shtick, it's pretty good. Also, I enjoyed that. Like, there's always. I reckon every group will have one player who never gets the name right at any point, um, because <laughs> that's right, you know, yeah. yeah, that's its own running gag. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. I... So don't be don't be afraid of the the puns. I do agree they're largely awful. But that is the thing. If that's the if they were supposed it. to be the actual joke, that would be that would be terrible. That is that is true. Yeah, that makes sense as, you, as you've described it. I'm reminded a little bit of in the last couple of months, I've been informally developing this theory of adventure writing, adventure design, mostly informed by the fact that I've been so steeped in trophy. But and I've been calling it the blooming flower theory of adventure design, and basically what it means is. In the text, on the page, you pack things in really tightly, like you put in a lot of stuff. And in other contexts that I've been talking about this, it's mostly been like about theme. That's the context I've been talking about it. You take the theme of the adventure, the theme of the module, and you just put the theme everywhere. You just like pack every moment, every detail, every little thing with like references to the theme or the big idea. And the blooming flower part is when you're actually playing it, it doesn't feel packed and forced like it does on the page because in play you have like the space between conversations at the table you have the die rolls you have things that are happening that help sort of spread it out and so it becomes it feels very cogent and coherent and a good experience even though on the page it feels very sledgehammer and i was wondering if maybe that's what's going on here too all this stuff is packed in so tight so that when you're playing it, you you do some of it and it lands. Because you can't do every joke that's in here, yeah. but you can probably do like enough of it. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think it is. I think that's a, a sort of a relatively common strand in a way of a lot of osr things as well. You know, because the encounter table as a thing is, you know, you're almost never going to see all of it per session. Like it's always designed with the knowledge that large amounts are never going to be seen, which is sort of a counterpoint to that idea that I think is especially common in, let's say, console games, where it's like, if you don't see everything that's in the game, it's wasted content. But of course, right. role-playing games yeah. don't. And that has seeped over, I would say, into analog game design as well. But it's not really true. You know, if not every joke lands, if people don't even look at the herbs in the kitchen so you don't get a chance to deliver the pun names, fine. Right. Uh, by the way, that uh, angry imp in a jar, very good character to play and bring along. Which is uh, yeah, like, there's lots of things designed for um, you know emergent play, which is a phrase that gets trotted out a lot. The angry imp, which the text tells us is imp located in something. Oh boy, 
Okay. <laughs> so Yeah. <laughs> Although that's a perfect example of one you will never be able to deliver <laughs> in speech. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know, maybe your attempt to work that in is what's funny. I well, that's know. true, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is comedy? Who knows? Okay, so I, I feel like I've come around on this. I do think it's a really good module. Like, I think it's a very interesting approach. While just a strict read is maybe not the most amusing thing in the world, <laughs> I can see how in play it maybe wouldn't be quite like that. Let's talk about some more granular things that we liked as far as the content here. A lot of great characters here, I'll agree, I'll agree to that. I mean, Mortzen Gerstorm himself seems like he'd be very fun to play. Is that true? He is a delight to play. I think it's the keystone of the whole adventure. If, if he was not there, I mean, I would say that the adventure has, has done a good job of... It's got a light-hearted atmosphere and it's got funny stuff, but the author has also taken quite seriously the job of designing a good module. So that part is, is fine and solid. But what really sells it, yeah, is Mortz and Gustav. He is like it's really hard to shut up once you start playing him. The tour, which I thought would be because actually just to backtrack a bit, yeah, the, the structure is basically the characters show up, they're given a guided tour of by the villain of his lair. And then he turns on them, so then the, the adventure sort of begins. And you would think that the tour part would get a bit boring, but it doesn't really because everyone's busy trying to sneak off to rooms they weren't shown or just talking to Mortzingersturm or trying to do stuff under his nose. I've got to say, the text says he has, and I quote, a somewhat monotone German-esque accented voice. But in this instance, I kind of decided that subtlety is the last refuge of the coward. So I went full Teutonic Liberace. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you're going to see something that will blow your minds. It's amazing, that kind of thing. So, um, actually, that's not really very fair on Liberace. He was quite a, a shy man in life, I think, compared to his. Uh, he was a very delicate yeah. Yeah. character. Yeah, mm, yeah, yeah. But you know, I mean, the, the sort of the public perception of him. Yeah, it. he was visually that. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, I'm talking about mid seventies, giving guided tours of his house. That's what I. Oh, right. That's why I went <laughs> yeah. there because I remember seeing a video of a time where he gave a, like this whole documentary thing a tour of his ludicrously large hollywood mansion which has got like <laughs> piano motifs everywhere that's what i was yeah. thinking of amazing yeah yeah <laughs> that's good stuff i think the best area is quite fun in its way it's amusing at least mm. the theta bar thing is actually pretty great i was actually really into that and when i read the theta bar part was when the module when the text anyway started to pull me back on its side because i thought that was i like how in love this module is with old Hollywood and old mm, things, yeah, you know, yeah. you've kind of hinted at it already, but, and here we have a literal real person from uh, the silent film era, or actually even before the silent film era, like kind of stage. Like, yeah, I think she like, was a stage Theta... actress before. I'm not that. Yeah. yeah. And... I know she wasn't really from Egypt. She was from Cincinnati. <laughs> she was <laughs> indeed not. Yeah. But you know, her whole like persona was the sort of like vamp persona. She's mm. typically held up as like the first goth or whatever. Mm. And so it was kind of fun to see her here presented as this sort of blasé, self-involved vampiress, <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Which I and you, you, you know, I She's love a, turban, a celebrity dropped you know? into a to a D D game for no reason with my yeah. So yeah, yeah, I appreciate yeah, I appreciate the hutz part of just changing the name by deleting a space in the middle of it, and that's it. You know, it's just <laughs> right, like, yeah. well, and it's stuff. interesting because like I'm gonna just go out on a limb and guess that ninety percent of the people who are gonna pick up this module don't know who Theta Bar is. Hmm. There's that interesting aspect, too, of, like, if you don't know, someday you might stumble on Thetabara, the real person, and, and be and be amused or have, like, a have a new appreciation for the module. Hopefully. So, hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Shall we go to the questions? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. And you've already kind of answered one of mine. Basically, one of my big questions was, during the tour portion, what are the players meant to be doing? I couldn't quite figure that out. It sounds like they were just like abandoning the tour and doing whatever, and then coming well, back to the tour. No, yeah, they were, they were quite obedient about it as well. Uh, in one group, we kind of informally agreed that one or two people might be able to slope off because uh, I, I just based it, yeah. it on. I think it was just last year. I got forced to do some guided tours around a trade show for my. It's not actually my job, but what you know, it was one of those things. And I did find that it's impossible to keep people on a guided tour if they don't want to go, right? So, you you know, you're trying to herd these idiots from one place to the next. And uh, sorry if you're listening. And, and we're on one of those tours. I don't really think you're idiots. I'm just, you know, it's just emotions. But um, yeah, yeah. So I, I felt like you could do what a tour guide would do and sort of read the table 
if they start to get bored with the menagerie, for example, just step it up and move along, say what the animal is, get it over with. But if they're enjoying looking at the tiger pillar, and who wouldn't? And sometimes, yeah, they'd be more interested in one animal than the other, and they'd try and kind of interact with it. Bad idea. It was a mixed bag, I would say, like the, the interest <laughs> levels. And that's okay, because like, if they're not interested, you just crack on. Move on, yeah. I'm reminded a little bit of... Pee Wee Herman leaving that tour to go find the basement in the Alamo. And then the tour guide saying, there's no basement in the Alamo. You know, anyway. <laughs> okay. Another question I had is, did your characters end up being transported to the World's Fair in 1893 Chicago? <laughs> no, but they did find that portal and they did throw a rock through it to see if it was real. So it hit someone and they had one of those classic, hey, what are you doing? Kind of conversations. That was good. Maybe, and then, maybe it hit H.H. Uh, H. Holmes on the head. <laughs> I don't know who that is, but okay. Um, so, wait, who's H.H. H. Holmes? The serial killer who like built the oh, house of terror. Oh, with the murder house. Yes, yeah, yeah. I do know who he is. Of course, yeah, murder house. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I know who the murder house guy is. What am I talking about? Yeah, <laughs> but that foreshadowed a character actually going through a portal at the end of the adventure. Right, he'd gone into the oubliette and he just dropped down without a way of getting back up because he was feeling super brave or you know thinking it was a one shot, which it was. And so he stepped just to get out, just stepped through the portal and found himself on the western front of the First World War. Also, he was like a frog man, so that confused people. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. Oh, a little side note. This feels like a very Hydra co-op thing. I feel like it he does, always had some it? kind of tr- be transported to another time and place. That's Just right, because there's the randomly. space <laughs> transport door thing in uh, Operation Unfathomable, isn't there? You can go to the future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, your questions. Yes, I had some questions. How deadly is this meant to be? Because, like, I took quite to heart the parts that imply that Morts and Kostum is fatally easily distracted like when you're up to no good you can just ask him an unrelated question generally it has a light tone but some of the text around like for example the bit where he traps the pcs in a pit to eat them it seemed like it was on the agenda had become like if they don't think fast they're all gonna die so yeah i wasn't sure if i was pitching it right what what impression did you get from this you know i can't say i gave it a lot of thought i got the impression that it was meant to be a light-hearted romp and that if someone actually died it would really clash with the tone it would kind of, of kill the mood wouldn't it? Yeah. but then <laughs> the know, marketing copy like does I'm mention a tpk so i don't know i'm confused imagine you're the person who gets killed by the clown naga right <laughs> <Bumble> <laughs> like bears, its yeah. head is bouncing around like a jack-in-the-box i mean come that's, on, actually, that's actually properly disturbing though i think that might be the scariest thing in the whole uh <laughs> Thing. <laughs> yeah, it might be. No, fair enough. And then uh, the other one, okay, not exactly a question, but I do want to sort of raise the issue. Mortzengestern is literally creating slave goblins to serve him. And like that, and to a degree, what happened to the ho- the horse thief guy, it does sort of create these moments, when genuinely happened like a couple of times, where the jollity slightly falls away and someone goes, oh, this is quite bad, isn't it? Like, you realise he's a proper villain. So like, I, eh, there's not really a question here. It's not like a huge gaping lacuna around which you must skirt in the module but you do have to sort of handle that a little delicately i would say when it crops up because there is that switch between oh look at the funny lion man and (laughs) (laughs) oh no he actually is an awful monster who's properly evil right no a fair observation indeed Mm -hmm. let's go to the chain lightning round speaking of that thief who is changed into a horse We are told that he is a frightened horse skulking around in the shadowed recesses of the room near the door, wearing a blanket haphazardly coated in hippogriff feathers by means of disguise, fooling no one but the hippogriffs, and only then due to their short attention spans. I like the ink dog. All the menagerie animals are pretty fun, but most of them are straightforward, you know, animal A plus animal B, whereas the ink dog... It's just really hard to picture, like uh, the undescribed diadems in The Dying Earth. And so it's kind of using the unique characteristics of playing an RPG rather than, you know, reading a novel or watching a movie in a way that supports this amazing sense of wonder, which is is great. I think this module's reliance on puns is most welcome when it's a pun that demonstrates how in love the module is with old Hollywood. And here we have an example in Fay Ray, that's F-E-Y, 
R-A-Y, a fox purple manta ray with fuzzy moth antenna and membranous fins like monarch butterfly wings on its tail. It hovers with a languid undulation of its large fins as if it were underwater. The cage is empty, but passing through the interior feels like moving through water. Okay, you're going to laugh, but I literally only just got the Fey Ray thing now. Unbelievable. (laughs) Just (laughs) pass me by. Wow. Okay, my second one, uh, Thidabara, the undead chanteur as an actress. Yeah, she is... Well, we've talked about her too much now. She's not a great lightning round entry anymore. But yeah, particularly if you enjoy tales of fading Hollywood icons, she's a great character to play and interact with, uh, second only to the title character. I am willing to admit that the name of one of the pre-generated characters, Wolf Howlin, <laughs> that name is pretty great. I liked uh, Mortzengestern's dialogue talking about hippogriffs, uh, which is... These noble creatures have long been considered impossible animals due to the natural proclivity of griffins to eat horses. With the impossible, I consider merely a challenge. Let's go to the expert delve. It's the expert delve. Listeners, you should know that I am looking at the notes right now, and they are copious. Tom has written quite a treatise for us today and i'm dying to hear him talk about it what is the topic for today tom the topic of my ted talk today will be the gunfights of john woo an approach to information (laughs) very good yeah why don't you go ahead and unpack this one for us set it up i don't know i kind of feel like i want to let it sit for a while it's only going to go downhill from here but okay so (laughs) one of the most uh, interesting things about uh morton gustum to me like i think one of the most striking things about its structure is, yeah, the way that literally give the PCs a tour of most of the adventure's play space before it definitively turns them loose on it. And the parallel, and the John Woo reference here, is it's similar to how John Woo, the Hong Kong film director, always or almost always carefully explores the setting of an upcoming action scene so that once the shooting starts, the audience can fully enjoy what's happening as characters move around the space so the very good or like a really easy to pass example here is in his film Hard Boiled where by the time the warehouse fight scene begins which if I recall correctly begins with Chow Yun-Fat descending through a skylight uh, with a machine gun in each hand on a rope but we in the audience have been shown the layout of this whole warehouse and its adjoining offices and things through a series of quite a lot of crane shots that give us a comprehensive view of the open spaces so you can see like yeah, where there's open space, places where someone might take cover, all that kind of thing you need in an action sequence. Although I'll mention that they're not like kind of long establishing shots. I think when we see these shots, it's full of action like triads smashing up the place and killing people, Anthony Wong cruising along in a Mercedes. The purpose of this is it's sort of the opposite of the uh, shaky cam fights of the 2000s that people used to complain about a lot because, you know, they'd always say... I can't tell what's happening in this dark, shaky fight sequence. It's all just close-ups of people's elbows and pistols and things. And yeah, that's the problem is it's a lack of context. An example of the long establishing shot version of this way of setting up the fight is the House of Blue Leaves in Kill Bill Volume 1. When you have that like tracking shot that goes through every part of the house of believe starting at the bathroom going down to the sort of like little main dance floor area then upstairs and you see every little part of it it occurs to me that that was a a very languid or decadent way of doing the same thing yeah, right? it's right, very it's right. very indulgent yeah but a great scene okay so i like this and you're saying that basically the way that morton gersturm gives you a tour of the whole dungeon <laughs> is what's essentially what's doing it does the same thing right it kind of sets everything up yeah and i do want to stress it's a little bit different from just having like an establishing shot and so on so to give another abstruse example like in indian classical music there's a thing called the alap at the beginning of each performance where they kind of play through all the components they're going to use later mm. and then after that's over in the music that follows it's the job of the virtuoso lead performer to elaborate on those components and combine them in oh. ways that they both sound good and and this is important surprise and delight the audience okay well yeah john coltrane's version of my favorite things he plays it through normally once then he starts just doing variations on that theme it's not quite like that it's where you kind of lay out the components and that's what i think Morton gustum does is it really is setting out like here's piece a here's piece b you could go back to the kitchen and explore uh, for you know useful ingredients there are hippogriffs here it's laying out the pieces in a very methodical way 
much more than just like walking into one room and saying, here's D6 goblins and <laughs> describing the lay of the land. Although that is the basic version of this, right? In d d it's the throw down the battle map and you can see everything you need to see in a two-dimensional sense. And then it gets elaborated on the, the DM goes, uh, yeah, this is actually a bubbling pool of lava. Over here, there's like a chandelier hanging up on the ceiling. That kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think there's a way of doing this that is like, that's how Morsinger Sturm does it, which is like in the fiction, a character is literally showing you everything. There's a way of doing this that is a little bit more procedural, I think, and that's kind of what the battle mat thing is. Mm. It's not like an in-fiction thing. It's just a way of, it's more of a procedural thing where the GM says, okay, now we're going to take a look at this. This is kind of giving you the lay of things. I think the Trophy Gold does this in a similar way, or maybe kind of a blending of these two. But essentially, whenever you enter a new set, not only do, does the GM tell you like what the goal of this of this area is, whether your characters know it or not, but also they lay out what are called the props. Like they show you like, okay, they say, you see this, you see this, you see this, you see this, now go investigate. It's a similar idea, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. It's sort of like a dungeoneering parallel to uh, what we talked about before of, you know, having mugshots of your mystery suspects. Like, so these are the ones you need to care about. And yeah, other things you might bring in, but it's not too important. Yeah, so more abstractly than dungeon rooms, you can and people do do this with the play space of character interactions and and relationships so i think pbta games are, tend to do this pretty well so you know your session one in well session one in apocalypse world is the just do a day in the life monster hearts was more directed you know who sits where in in a homeroom the day in the life thing is serves the same purpose though mm. like I, i've yeah. run lots of apocalypse world and that first session that day in the life session it has the effect of laying out all the components of what's going to be happening in the campaign exactly. but it's in a sort of like weird I don't know if inverse is the right word, but it's in a different way in the sense that these are components that the GM might not even know about yet. Right, exactly. Yeah, I want to do a quick bit of self-promotion. I wrote a game once called Melandros that nobody plays, and it deliberately does this so that when you're creating your characters, the neighborhood and cast of player and non-player characters exist by the time you play your first scene. The danger, actually, and this is something to think about when we're considering like our laying out the components approach, is that it's very tempting to start playing before the game starts. Like you start going, oh, oh, maybe we could have had this conversation about this. You know, our characters could have been arguing about where the fence should be for years and years. And then people start to kind of quasi in character actually have the conversation and you have to kind of reel it in and avoid jumping the gun, essentially. I have an anecdote here about Melandros, actually. So I don't know if you recall the game that you ran for us um, at GauntletCon a few years ago. I do. Yeah, that was great that I think eventually ended up in a podcast feed somewhere. It's really good, by the way, listeners. I remember when we were doing that neighborhood setup process, I remember thinking, this is taking a long time. It's fun. I like it. But it's taking a long time. And I wonder if we're going to have any time to actually tell a story when this is over. <laughs> because we have a we have a three-hour slot. And we, you know what, what are we going to be able to get done? But in fact, laying out the, the whole like lay of the neighborhood actually really helped the role play in my opinion and it helped us get to a very very good story outcome because everybody was so everyone like understood the moving parts really well and was able to like lock and load into the role play very fast and so we were able to get like a really good tight contained story within that period of time and so i think that that's maybe another advantage of doing the john we'll call it the john woo style scene setting right (laughs) like there's this advantage of where it essentially like eases the role play in a lot of ways i think that's a major advantage you're not having to spend time lumbering about wondering what's this or what's that or what can i do or what can't i do when it's all laid out really nicely you know and you can kind of get in there and do it again going back to trophy gold it's a similar idea Trophy Gold is interested in you you as a player getting in there and investigating the thing. It's not interested in like hiding things from you unless there's like meant to be like a reveal kind of thing. But for the most part, it just wants you to get in there and do the thing. And so it is a play aid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's worth noting, right, that surprises are still part of the game. You know, guided tours don't show you everything about the place. They only show you what fits the purpose of the guide that's leading you. So like... Morton Gusturm has two areas that are not on the tour, the kind of wizard's inner sanctum and the oubliette of failed creature attempts. The, the mistakes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the mistakes. But you, you're aware that they exist, right? Because you can see them on the route. You know, you can see the hatch that leads to the oubliette, but 
your guide's not going to tell you what it is. And you can see the building that houses his secret lab, but again, he's not going to mention it. Yeah, there's still that potential for surprise. And yet, that's still some knowledge, isn't it? Like, this is an unknown space. Um, <laughs> as noted politician Donald Rumsfeld once said, it's, it's a known unknown. And <laughs> that makes it interesting in itself, right? right. Indeed, indeed. I'm glad we're talking about surprises, though, because I think we need to convert this into, you know, what does this actually mean for GMs and players? Um, <laughs> right, yeah. So, I mean, one thing I'll say is it's kind of, it's the domain of classic GM advice, right? A lot of this is not really worth rehashing because it's an approach, not a set of concrete steps, right? Just thinking about this, how you would lay out your components is uh, a point of view that you can kind of put on and off as you need. And... Yeah, I think one of the questions for GMs in particular is like when you look at the elements that you have ready for your adventure, whether it's whatever format it's in, and you think about what you've already told them so far, <laughs> you could do this at any point while you're running the game. Is there anything that's going to surprise them in a non-fun way <laughs> coming up? Mm, like the thing yeah. that instead of them like making them go, oh, wow, brilliant, or oh, no, this is terrifying, would just make them go, oh, well, if I'd known about that, I would have brought 50 foot of rope. It's just kind of a drag sometimes when something is it blindsides you. So I think that's a valuable yeah, question yeah. to ask, you know, to ask yourself. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think there's a key tips and takeaways here as much as it's just a sort of general sense of thinking about how you're structuring things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, just I think the literal tour of uh, Mortz and Gustum, I think, is just a great thing to latch on to for a GM to think. If I was giving someone a tour of this space station or this neighborhood, what would be on the tour and what would be left off? Yeah. And as long as you've covered the tour, you're probably you're probably good, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. I see that you also have some tips here for players and well, if we must, what are they? <laughs> players have a, a role to play here as well because the you know, all these questions for GMs, oh, have I shown them enough stuff? Well, one way to help them know that is to ask them questions about things that you don't know or you feel like your character would observe. So, I mean, I feel like there must be some good like way to list like specific questions you could ask, but I don't know, man, I, I'm a busy guy and I couldn't really think of that many, but you know, <laughs> it's certainly it's worth, if you're thinking about like, especially at the early stages of the adventure, you know, as you approach the village, you might start asking about, I guess, asking yourself, what kind of scene do you expect to be in this adventure? What kind of activities are you likely to do and then maybe just gently probe to verify if your suppositions are correct mm. well i think that i think it's this is interesting because it changes quite a bit if we're talking about a game that is more collaborative in nature mm. i mean apocalypse world games like that games where the setting is not canon at the start like and you're sort of creating it as you go or say the monster hearts uh, classroom procedure as you mentioned there is a space where the player i think can have a much more like active role in in sort of creating the tour even you know and kind of saying, yeah like, this is what's over here this is what's over there because they have, they have explicit permission to do so yeah for sure i mean even in like kind of you know say a classic DD, if you say i'm a barbarian from a fishing village that means that the people who are considered barbarian have fishing villages you're doing a bit of setting creation but yeah session ones in something like apocalypse world i think a great thing to do there is to seize your opportunity to kind of make the play space involve components that you're interested in right um, yeah. one so one example i have of that is in a play by post of apocalypse world that you were in actually um which is oh, i thought this sounded familiar more, yeah. i was looking at the notes i was like why does this seem familiar to me yeah yeah so yeah i had a character called gemini who uh, ran a nightclub in an old toys r us and that, yeah. Yeah, like in that session one, I was asked, like, what's the problem? What's this, you know, or like, what's the situation with this club? And of course, it's tempting to go hyper defensive if you're someone who has an establishment in, you know, there's kind of two kinds of characters in Apocalypse World and often in RPGs of any kind. There are the ones who are nomads who are on the move and the ones who own a thing and want to protect the thing. But I tend to think that establishments are only interesting if you're building them or if they're collapsing. So in that session one, I said, like, one of the attractions of this nightclub was uh, the recreational pharmaceuticals. And I said, well, we're running out. We've only got enough for one more big party. And that is, like, I just decided this is going to be about, if we end up concentrating on my nightclub, which we kind of did, it's going to be about that last hurrah, essentially. That's the kind of thing I'm going to do. My participation in that particular play-by-post, I was just giving a tour of the bathroom, and that was it. <laughs> that was, I mean, the less said about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, any uh, closing thoughts here? I thought this was pretty good. 
I don't know, not many. I I just <laughs> restate that uh, caveat. This is these are not concrete tips. This is just a thing to think about as you go along. You know, it's uh, I, I I do find that deliberately like adopting different perspectives when when prepping or running or playing things is quite a good idea. It can be hard to sort of break out once you get into a groove, especially halfway through a session, say around the tea break time. It can be hard to shake out of like just thinking about the next scene, what's going to happen next. But if you can force yourself into that, have I properly shown everyone the component parts of this game, that will provide benefits in the ensuing one to two hours. Awesome. Let's go to the next segment. It's the Companion Adventures. Okay, so here's the deal. If you are not... (laughs) committed to doing some characterization in this module i don't know what the point of running it is so (laughs) (laughs) like you you have to be willing to do some characterizations particularly on morton gristurm on theodobara on uh, on the goblins on the ridiculously formal hippogriffs at the beginning like if you're just reading the text off the page, what are you doing? So let's talk about characterizations. I've got two films, which I think are going to be great to look at to kind of get some ideas for how you characterize these NPCs. The first is Sunset Boulevard. In particular, we are looking at the actress Gloria Swanson playing Norma Desmond. She is a character that is just sort of swans through every scene she's in and dominates every scene and she is dramatic and she's a little crazy and she has in a way almost like a vampire-like quality i consider sunset boulevard to be a vampire story even though there's no literal vampires in it so obviously i think this is a great touchstone for the Thetabara character so that's my first recommendation. Yeah, it's just such a great movie as well because it's, it's one of those movie, yeah. it's one of those films that it opens with you seeing the end i'm not going to I mean, it's five minutes in, but I'm not going to spoil it now. But all the way through the film, you keep finding yourself going, oh, maybe it's going to turn out differently. And then you remember, oh, no, I've seen the ending already. Yeah. It's not. So. It's a great yeah. movie. I watched it I watched it again a couple of years ago, and it holds up so, so well. It's just a classic. And everyone needs to have a Norma Desmond type character in them anyway. If you know, have that in your life, oh, it's yeah. all ready to go. Absolutely. It serves a lot of purposes. Yeah. My other recommendation for... NPC characterization here is Joel Gray as the MC in the film Cabaret. Now the module actually has some little winking nods to Cabaret anyway, but uh, I think that Joel Gray's performance as the MC is a great character here, possibly for the little goblin character that is Mortzengersturm's aide. I think you could even play Mortzengersturm in this way. Mm. Um, I actually quite like Tom's slightly drier take on Mortzucker Storm that he's been doing throughout this episode. But I think that the Joel Grey performance there is really good. And Cabaret's a great movie. Yeah, yeah, nice. I will follow up uh, those films with uh, one from 1915 called A Fool There Was, because from the, uh, you mentioned the phrase vamp, this was the original vamp, uh, as in the origin of the term, because Theda Barra herself, and this is one of the few extant films that she was in, uh, she plays a character actually called The Vampire in this movie although she's really she's just a femme fatale who seduces a guy on a ship but whatever um <laughs> so and it's on youtube because it's over 100 years old so no <laughs> there's no copyright on that <laughs> and uh, so yeah yeah definitely if you want to know what the real theater Barra looked like give it a quick watch it's a little stagey as silent films tended to be but uh, you could see i don't think it's if you see theater Barra, um as a cleopatra or something that's like a whole different level but this at least is 1920s femme fatale version and then uh, my second film is more about the aesthetic of Mortz and Gustav. and by the way wouldn't this book be amazing if it was in colour all the way through because I like that colour palette on the cover and then like, it really oh, would yeah, the co- yeah it really would the cover is like it's such a good selling point for this like I can see how you would just like You know, if this was like printed out on shelves, you'd see that and be like, oh, I want this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, my film, I think, kind of matches the look quite well. And that is the 1970 mostly animated film, The Phantom Tollbooth, uh, based on the book by, is it Norton Juster, I want to say? Anyway, um, it doesn't really matter what it's about. This kid goes through a magic toll booth and ends up in a wacky cartoon world where numbers can be eaten or whatever it was. You know, there are monsters based on emotions and there's a 
weatherman who floats around in balloons. The whole point is that it has that very exaggerated, craggy kind of cartoon look to it. Mm -hmm. Lots of tall, towering mountains and castles and strange creatures. And I honestly don't know how good it is because I watched it when I was about like eight years old, many times on video. <laughs> so, but I definitely remember what it looked like. Look for clips if you can't find the whole thing. Indeed, indeed. Any other recommendations for companion adventurers? Yeah, I've got one more. It's a role-playing game adventure. And uh, my original note for this just said, what was that theme park thing called that Skirfors did? The answer is The Mysterious Menagerie of Dr. Orville Boros. Mm. And this is a free adventure you can get. It sort of goes with Skirfors' apocrypha, epoch uh, it's a thing about different ages of, of time so he did a source book and this is the adventure that kind of uses it and so it's a, a mad wizard's theme park that has sort of portals to different eons throughout history and prehistory and uh, naturally things go wrong and it's faintly hilarious enough said awesome Listeners, that's our show. Fear of Black Dragon is a production of The Gauntlet. You can find The Gauntlet on Twitter at GauntletRPG. We have a website. It's gauntlet-rpg.com. If you'd like to support Fear of a Black Dragon financially, and please do because it helps us keep making the show, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. Uh, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jason. And thank you to our esteemed editor, Rich Rogers. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hello listeners, I wanted to let you know about Codex Hearthfire, the newest issue of the Gauntlet's tabletop role-playing game magazine, now available on Patreon. Hearthfire includes Packet, a game about the transatlantic journey from Liverpool to New York in the 1800s. Can you navigate the troubled waters between hope and home? Respite, a game of comfort and companionship through adversity, explored via stories told around a communal fireplace between battles. The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soulless, a new mystery for Brindlewood Bay. Trophy Gold Hearthfire, a major expansion for Trophy Gold that adds new storytelling options to downtime and upkeep. Three dozen precarious places to make camp, nine original illustrations, and a beautiful custom layout. You can get Codex Hearthfire in the Gauntlet Patreon feed by making a $6 pledge in July. Your pledge helps support all the great work we do in the Gauntlet, including our Gauntlet Open Gaming Weekends and this very podcast. Thanks. Mortzinger. I always have to look at it in the notes. Mortzinger Sturm. <laughs> Mortzinger Sturm. I see, I got it wrong now as well.